Jesus said to some who were questioning him, Have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Well, we sing to begin this morning a hymn that reminds us <clears throat> of our history, going back all the way to God's promise to Abraham. Number 199, the God of Abraham prays, who reigns enthroned above, the ancient of everlasting days, and God of love. This is our God, and we sing to him our praise. Number 199. <laughs>
Well, we join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Gladly, O oh God, we bow, naming your name, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel, who alone is God of all the earth and all the heavens. And to you we lift our voice in prayer, knowing that you alone are God and Lord of this world and all that are in it, and yet knowing also that you are the one who has covenanted to be our Father, our God, great and gracious, who has sworn to us that you will be our Savior, our Deliverer from sin and death on that great day, the day of your power, so that we might have security and peace knowing that we are yours and belong to you forever and ever. And so, Lord, our praise this morning is joined with that of all heaven and with all on this earth who know you and love you, as we with them rejoice to name your name and to express from the depths of our heart the joy of what it means to be your people. And as we gather this morning, Lord, we come to humble ourselves before you, to seek your face, to hear your word. We're so conscious of our sins, which should rightly drive you far away from us, from all our failures, from all our weaknesses, all these things that grieve us so much, even as we know they grieve you. But keep us, we pray, O oh Lord. Forgive us. Restore us. Renew us and, and lead us by your Holy Spirit that we might live lives that please you. Even as we trust in your unfailing love and as we seek to live to honor your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Master, our Lord, and our leader, and who is the joy of our lives. So hear us, Lord, that we may live so as to glorify him every day of this coming week, and grant us this morning the strengthening of your grace through the wonderful provision of your word of light to our hearts, that we might love you more dearly and serve you more nearly every day of our lives here on earth. And we ask it for the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, let me uh, welcome you very warmly indeed to our fellowship here this morning. Uh, whether you're upstairs and I can see you, or uh, in the overflows downstairs, I trust that you can see and hear us. Uh, if it's your first time with us uh, here at the Tron, then you're very welcome indeed, and we hope that you will feel that welcome and feel very much at home with us here as a family of God's people. Can I draw your attention to the, uh, to the sheets here? Uh, you should have them on your seat or nearby. Um, there are lots of notices in there about things going on this coming week. I'll leave you to read that middle section, uh, many of the usual things uh, continuing this week and very much needing our prayers, so do remember that. On the right-hand side there, this Friday evening, we have a special uh, event with uh, a guest speaker, John Blanchard. That's going to be held down at our Kelvin Grove building. And there are still some tickets available, uh, but not many, I think. So please do get your tickets today for yourselves and your guests. It'll be an informal evening in the coffee lounge there with coffee and good things to eat. And uh, John will give a short talk on why it is a reasonable thing to trust the Bible. And uh, he'll be open to questions, and it's just the opportunity for friends and family members who want to fire their killer questions, their difficult questions uh, to us. Well, bring them along and let them fire them at John, and he will give able answers. So please do be praying for that, and uh, if you're hoping to come along, do get your tickets uh, today. That will be the last opportunity, I think. Down uh, under Nota Bene, let me just thank very especially those of you who fed us so well at the pastor's conference this week. 
Uh, the delights of your baking uh, were very well received, along with the food of God's word. And uh, a warm welcome, a warm thank you to all of you uh, who helped out with that. It was very greatly appreciated. Then finally, this evening, we have our service as usual at 6.30, but not as usual. We will not be in this building. Repeat, we will not be in this building, but we will be in our Kelvin Grove building this evening in Claremont Street. So please don't turn up here expecting to be a service, but do come to Kelvin Grove. For some of you, it'll be your first chance to come. Uh, it will be our first chance as a congregation to meet all in one auditorium together with no overflows. Uh, for, well, three and a half years. So that's quite a special occasion. And uh, it's a very special occasion this evening because it will be the ordination service of Paul Brennan uh, as our associate minister. Dick Lucas is going to be our guest preacher. And we have numbers of guests and visitors coming from other churches, a number of ministers from other churches coming to join in with us, including the Didasco Fellowship of Churches, the little fellowship of churches we are forming uh, with others who have a, a shared history to ours. So please don't miss this evening. I know that for some of you it might be difficult. If you're on a bus and your bus just doesn't go the right direction for Kelvin Grove, fear not. Um, we're going to have some cars here at 6 o'clock. So if you come here at 6 uh, you will be able to get a lift across and a lift back at the end, either to here or to home. Uh, so please don't let anybody stay away on account of that. We'll do our very best uh, to help you. There is plenty of parking uh, near Kelvin Grove, and uh, that ought not to be a problem uh, this evening. But perhaps I'd encourage you to get there early, especially if you're not quite sure of the way, and uh, make sure that you, uh, you get there in good time for the service. Please do be praying for this evening, and uh, come along, and let's ensure that it's a time of great gladness and uh, of real praise and thanksgiving to God. Well, I'll let you read the rest of these notices uh, at your leisure, and we're going to turn to our Bible reading for this morning, which you'll find in the Old Testament in the book of Ezra at chapter 8. Edward is resuming his uh, series, uh, which he was uh, doing until recently on Sunday evenings. Uh, if you have a church Bible, that's page 394. And we're going to read together the whole of this uh, long chapter 8 with all sorts of difficult names, so please forgive me if I don't get them quite right. And uh, many of them are Persian names, so perhaps our Iranian friends will put me right as to the pronunciation after the service. Ezra chapter 8 at verse 1. These are the heads of their father's houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me, that is with Ezra, from Babylonia in the reign of Artaxerxes the king, of the sons of Phinehas, Gershom, of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel, of the sons of David, Hattush, of the sons of Shechaniah, who was uh, of the sons of Parosh, Zechariah, with whom were registered 150 men. Of the sons of Pathav Moab, Elohenai, the son of Zerahiah, and with him 200 men. Of the sons of Zatu, Shechaniah, the son of Jehaziel, and with him 300 men. Of the sons of Adin, Eved, the son of Jonathan, and with him 50 men. Of the sons of Elam, Jeshiah, the son of Athaliah, and with him 70 men. Of the sons of Shepatiah, Zebediah, the son of Michael, and with him 80 men. Of the sons of Joab, Obadiah, the son of Jethiel, and with him 218 men. Of the sons of Bani, Shelemith, the son of Josephiah, and with him 160 men. Of the sons of Bebai, Zechariah, the son of Bebai, and with him 28 men. Of the sons of Asgad, Johanan, the son of Hakatan, and with him 110 men. Of the sons of Adonikam, those who came later, their names being Eliphalet, Jeol, and Shemaiah, and with them 60 men. Of the sons of Bigvi, Utai, and Zakur, and with them 70 men. I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava, and there we camped three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found there none of the sons of Levi. Then I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jareb, Elnathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, leading men, and for Jariab and Elnathan, who were men of insight. And I sent them to Ido, the leading man at the place Cassiphiah. 
telling them what to say to Edu and his brothers and the temple servants at the place Cassiphaia, namely, to send us ministers for the house of our God. And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of discretion, of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, son of Israel, namely Sherebiah, with his sons and kinsmen, 18. Also, Hashabiah, and with him, Jeshiah of the sons of Merari, and with his kinsmen and their sons, 20, besides 220 of the temple servants, whom David and his officials had set apart to attend the Levites. These were all mentioned by name. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. Then I set apart twelve of the leading priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their kinsmen with them. And I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels, the offering for the house of our God that the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had offered. I weighed out into their hand 650 talents of silver and silver vessels worth 200 talents and 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold worth 100, uh, 1,000 darics and two vessels a fine bright bronze, as precious as gold. And I said to them, You are holy to the Lord, and the vessels are holy, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering to the Lord, the God of your fathers. Guard them and keep them until you weigh them before the chief priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel at Jerusalem, within the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites took over the weight of the silver and of the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem, to the house of our God. Then we departed from the river Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes by the way. We came to Jerusalem. And there we remained three days. On the fourth day, within the house of our God, the silver and the gold and the vessels were weighed into the hands of Merimoth the priest, son of Uriah. And with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas. And with them were the Levites, Josabad, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Binui. The whole was counted and weighed, and the weight of everything was recorded. At that time, those who had come from captivity, the returned exiles, they offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and as a sin offering, 12 male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered to the king's commissions, to the king's satraps, and to the governors of the promise, uh, province beyond the river, and they aided the people and the house of God. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. We're going to sing again hymn number 172, which surely reflects the joy of the returning people of God as they worship God in Jerusalem. Bring to the Lord a glad new song, children of grace, extol your king. Number 172.
Well, we don't have uh, our Sunday schools on this morning. The summer Sunday schools, as you'll see in the sheet, begin next week. There is a creche for those under three down in the basement floor. And uh, also, if for some of the little ones, the service is just a bit too long, then after the next hymn, uh, you can, if you like, go down to the campsite room or to the wind where the service will be streamed. And uh, if you feel that will be easier for you, uh, that's open to you. But now in the quiet, our offerings will be received. And as the musicians play, let's be meditating quietly on God's word that we've heard and preparing ourselves to hear him speak to us uh, in the preaching. But our offerings for the Lord's work are received. We pray together. Our Father in heaven, as we bring these tokens of our giving before you, rejoicing to do so, knowing that we give to you only that which is yours, which you in your great generosity have blessed us with. We pray, Lord, that you would take these gifts along with all the regular giving of our fellowship not only in terms of money, but also in terms of our time and the gifts that you have given us. And receive these things gladly from our hands that you might take them and multiply them and put them to the use of extending the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, not only in this city, but throughout this nation and indeed the whole world. How we thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be a part of your great plan and purpose, that the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ should be extended to the very outer ends of this earth, that his name might be glorified among the nations, and that at last the command of the eternal God to bring upon all nations the obedience of faith might be fulfilled with gladness and joy and great glory in the heavens. How greatly in need our world is, O oh God. We look out all around us, and even this past week we're reminded that we live in a world full of great pain. We think of the tragedies last weekend and these shootings in Florida. We think of the terrible tragedy in our own land this week with the killing of one of our members of parliament as she went about her business serving the community and seeking to represent the people of the land in our democracy. And rightly, O oh God, our 
nation has been shocked by this crime. And rightly too, our leaders and parliamentarians have been silenced from their incessant bickering and fighting one another. To a few moments and a few days of dignity and of grief and of rightful honor and praise for the courage of those in public life who do serve us and who it is increasingly clear put their lives in danger by doing so. We pray for the grieving family of Joe Cox. We pray for her husband and children and the many who will be feeling great grief at this time. And in the wider community, the reminder of the world that we do live in, a world which is touched in every place by the pain of human sin and by the pain of the curse of your divine judgment upon this world, consigning us once again to that which we are made of, to the dust. Lord, may we be reminded in these dark days that you are God and we are but mortal and that our days pass away under your wrath. Teach us, we pray, to number our days that we might get a heart for wisdom, to understand that we are without you as nothing. But for your grace and mercy, we also would be in the dust. We're reminded, O oh God, that we live in a world full of the pride and hubris of men. In this week of important voting on the referendum, there stands before us the great institutions of the elites of men, built, it seems, like the Tower of Babel, seeking to reach up to heaven, from which we as men think we can rule the earth as gods ourselves. Lord, we pray that you would give us humility, help us to see the truth that is in the heart of man, that all who reach for the skies can only, in the end, tumble and fall, because the place of true greatness on this earth is found only by those who humble themselves and kneel before you, our maker and our ruler. We pray for our nation at this time of great moment when votes will be cast and a future will be forged either the one way or the other. And whatever the outcome, O oh God, let it be clear to all who name the name of Jesus Christ that whether our rule is exclusively from Westminster or also from Brussels, neither place can lead us in the path of righteousness Neither place can lead us in the ways that will make a nation prosper and not perish. If our leaders do not also look to the truth and to the righteousness that comes from you alone. So, Lord, we pray for our future. Whatever way the votes are cast this week, you would turn our people once again to a way of truth, to a way of humility to the knowledge that we need and seek a better rule than any man can give us, that we might turn again heartily to the way of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Lord, would you teach us all through this nation that though we live in a world of pain and though the danger is that we are full of pride and hubris, so our great need above all others is for the Prince of Peace himself. And so, Lord, we ask for your church in these islands, and very especially in our own land of Scotland, that she once again would be unashamed to recover the teaching of the Word of God made known in Jesus Christ. And even as we see Ezra the scribe putting the Word of God at the very heart of the fortunes of the future of his people Israel. So also we pray for the church in our land in our day that you would likewise bless us 
with those who see with the same clarity and therefore whose mission in life is to strengthen your church according to your word that she might be bold and courageous in a world full of corruption and full of darkness and that we as your people would be unafraid to name the name of Jesus and to point others to his light and his light alone so help us Lord and strengthen us now as we come to your word fill our hearts full of your goodness and grace we pray that we might be your true servants and might be unashamed on the great day of our Lord Jesus' return. For we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. We sing then as we come to God's word, number 558, which is a prayer that the Lord would teach us to see as Moses saw his will revealed in perfect law, a covenant divine, a word to make the simple wise, the light of truth before our eyes, and that it should shine in all our souls this day. Number 558. Well, friends, let's turn in our Bibles to Ezra chapter 8, once again, page 394, if you have our hardback edition, Ezra chapter 8. Now, I don't know whether you've ever listened to the Radio 4 program, which is called Taking the Long View. 
The BBC runs a series of this programme every once in a while, and it's presented by a man called Jonathan Friedland, uh, a journalist. And what Jonathan Friedland does is to take some contemporary issue of controversy or crisis, something like the crisis over immigration in Europe today, and he sets it over against a similar crisis that happened a century or perhaps even two centuries ago. So to take this example of immigration, he might describe a similar crisis of immigration that happened uh, in the 20th or even in the 19th century. So it's an exercise in comparing and contrasting. And it's remarkable and rather comforting to see just how similar some past crisis is to its modern counterpart. It helps you to see that the world has been there before and somehow has survived the crisis. And it encourages you to think that if the world survived that crisis of yesteryear, it might just survive the contemporary crisis. In other words, it gives some historical perspective on what is going on under our noses. Seeing the present in the light of the past helps you to deal more effectively with the present. Now, the Bible is rather like that. Certainly, the book of Ezra works like this. Let me put it this way. The history recorded in the Bible works at two levels. First of all, there is what you might call the great story, which starts with the old creation in the book of Genesis and ends with the new creation in the book of Revelation. That's the story of God's mighty deeds in the whole cosmos, but centering on his dealings with mankind and his glorious purpose achieved through the intervention of the Lord Jesus to, to salvage a people for himself from the wreckage of human sin, a people who will finally be transformed and made fit to share his heavenly home. Now that's the great story, and you and I are living in the last days of it. That is the period between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus. But there's a second and very important level in Bible history, and that is that within this great story, there are repeated patterns of events. And the Bible reader is intended to see those repeated patterns and to learn from them. And one of the most obvious of these patterns is the ebb and flow of the fortunes of the people of God. There are times of advance and progress and godliness. And then there are times of setback when the people rebel and become disobedient. You see that ebb and flow repeatedly in the Old Testament and strongly in a book like the Acts of the Apostles as well. So with this thought in mind, what pattern can we trace in the book of Ezra which might help us in our own day? How might we take the long view? How might the history recorded in the book of Ezra shed light on the problems and the opportunities that we face in the 21st century? Well, the big idea that links the book of Ezra to us is the need to rebuild the people of God after a time of difficulty and setback. Let's just remind ourselves for a moment of what was happening in Ezra's day. Ezra was living in the 5th century BC, and his great trek from Babylonia to Jerusalem, which is recorded here in chapter 8, took place in the year 458 BC. But the fortunes of Israel were in a sorry state and had been for quite a long time. The great tragedy, the great disgrace for Israel was the exile. Well over a century earlier, in the 590s and the 580s BC, the Babylonians had conquered Judah and Jerusalem, and they deported large numbers of the Jews to Babylonia. They sacked Jerusalem, they burned the temple, they knocked down the city in 587 BC. And for the Jews, this was an episode of unbelievable horror. How could God allow this to happen to them? Was he not the God with whom they were in covenant? Hadn't he promised to, to be their protector? Wasn't the great temple of Solomon an inviolable symbol of his presence among them? Well, the sad truth behind the exile, and you know this, was that God was punishing his people for their disobedience. For centuries, they'd been turning away from him, turning to idols. They'd been turning to foreign kings to protect them in times of trouble rather than turning to the Lord. They'd been neglecting the law of Moses and sometimes treating it with contempt. And the patience 
of a very patient God eventually ran out, and he caused the Babylonians to be the instrument of his punishment upon his own people. But although the blessings of the covenant had been forfeited for a while, the covenant itself had not been torn up. It was and it remains an everlasting covenant. And so it was after several decades of the Jews languishing in Babylonia that the Lord then stirred the spirit of Cyrus, who had come to the throne of the Persian Empire, he stirred Cyrus up to make a proclamation that the Jews should now return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and effectively to reconstitute the people of Israel in their own land. Now this was in 539 BC, and this is how the book of Ezra opens. Chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord takes the initiative. He stirs up the spirit of the pagan king Cyrus, and Cyrus commands the Jews to return. The covenant had never been rescinded. God was still working out his purpose in the great story. And so the Jews began to come back, not in great numbers at first, just a few thousands, but they headed back, and after various setbacks and difficulties, they had the temple rebuilt by the year 515 BC, which was 24 years after Cyrus's proclamation. And the story of those 24 years and how the temple was rebuilt is told in the first six chapters of the book of Ezra. But while the temple was now rebuilt and the sacrifices commanded in the law of Moses were now being regularly offered again, the people were languishing for lack of teaching. And this is where Ezra himself comes into the story, nearly 60 years later, in the year 458 BC. That was the year when he journeyed from Babylonia to Jerusalem. And if you look back for a moment to chapter 7, verse 10, you'll see that little pen portrait, 710, the pen portrait of Ezra, which gives us such a clear view of who he was and what he was equipped to do. Ezra, 710 had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. He had set his heart to study, to obey, and to teach. Now, friends, if you are a Bible teacher or a future Bible teacher, write that verse out on a piece of paper, stick it up on your kitchen wall, and learn it by heart because it will tell you the purpose of your life from now on. So in chapter 8, Ezra gathered his companions, hundreds of them as you can see. He gathered them on the banks of the river Ahava in Babylonia, and they set off across 900 miles of desert country and reached Jerusalem safe and sound about four months later. Now let's take the long view and see what light uh, this story might shed on our own situation. The people of Israel in 458 BC, they were up and running, but they were somewhat depleted and discouraged. They needed reviving, and in particular, they needed to be retaught the law of the Lord. Now, they had their Bibles, but they were largely ignorant of them. And Ezra knew that the thing which was necessary to bring life and health back into the people of God was the teaching of the words of Moses, because the people were spiritually starving. Man shall not live by bread alone. How then shall man live? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. As Deuteronomy had said, and Jesus said years later. And Ezra knew this, and that's why he had set his heart to study the law of God so that he could then obey it and teach it. Now, isn't our situation very similar today in the United Kingdom, and not least in Scotland? where the people of God, the churches, are up and running. It's not all gloom and discouragement. By no means there are bright lights shining in quite a few places. But in many places, the churches have grown thin and gaunt. You can tell a great deal about a local church by reading the church notice boards and looking at the weekly leaflets if you pop into the church building. And as you look at these signs of what's going on, the key question is, how much is the word of the Lord being fed to the congregation each week? Sometimes a church's weekly activities consist of mums and toddlers, 
Food Bank, Badminton Club, Choir Practice, Seniors Lunch Club, and hymn singing at the care home on Sunday afternoon. Now, those are all good things for Christian people to be involved in. But if there's no Bible, the church is dying. Man cannot live by bread alone, only by the words that come from the mouth of God. It's the Bible that creates the church, and it's the Bible that sustains the church. And this is what Ezra understood so well. So as we bend our ears to Ezra chapter 8 this morning, let's keep this long view in mind. Everything that Ezra does in this chapter is done for the sake of re-establishing the people of God so that they can be taught, nourished, and disciplined by the Word of God, and so that they should live their lives under His blessing. And that's surely what we long, I hope we long, to see happening in Scotland, a re-establishing of the churches of God by bringing them the Word of God, without which life and vitality are impossible. Well, now, as we look at Ezra chapter 8, let's notice five things that Ezra deeply understood and five things which we need also to understand. First, Ezra understood the history of Israel and the makeup of the people of Israel. Look at verses 1 to 14 for a moment. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 14. It looks rather like a random list of names, but it's not. Verse 1, these are the heads of their fathers' houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me, with Ezra from Babylonia, in the reign of Artaxerxes the king. Now, there's a careful ordering and arrangement of these names. The first two names mentioned in verse 2 are members of priestly clans. Gershom, descended from Phineas, and Daniel, descended from Ithamar. So the Israelite priesthood is represented, and it's given great prominence by Ezra by the fact that these names are put at the top of his list. The next name, still in, chapter, uh, still in verse 2, is Hattush, a descendant of David. So in verse 2, we have the priestly line from Aaron and the kingly line of David represented. We then have 12 more verses in this paragraph, verses 3 to 14, and each of those 12 verses describes one family, a lay family, not a priestly or a kingly family, but a family of ordinary Israelites. So do you see the shape of the section? The priestly line, the kingly line, and then we have 12 ordinary family lines. It's the people of Israel in miniature. So the point is being made that the people of God, Israel, are returning to the promised land as a reconstitution of Israel. But there's another very interesting feature to this list, and here's the second thing. Ezra understood the cost of following the Lord. We won't turn back to chapter 2 just now, but if we were to turn back to it, we would read there the names of all the Israelites who had set out 80 years previously in the initial wave of returnees back in 539 BC when Cyrus first issued his decree. Now, chapter 2 contains a much longer list of names than we have here in chapter 8. But, and this is the striking thing, with only one exception, all the family names that appear here in chapter 8 also appeared back in chapter 2. So what must have happened in 539 BC? Many Jewish families set out for Jerusalem, but clearly they did not take all their family members with them families were split. Those in a family who were bolder or more willing to, to trust the Lord, they launched out and they crossed the desert, while other ones stayed in Babylonia. And the descendants of the ones who stayed in Babylonia came on 80 years later when Ezra asked them to join his new expedition in 458 BC. So I think you can imagine some of the tensions in families back in 539 BC Crossing that 900 miles of desert would have been a, as big a step for them as it would have been for a Scottish family or an Irish family in 1880 to emigrate to America or Canada. It meant goodbye forever. Imagine a Scottish family going to America in the 19th century. There was no hopping on a British Airways jet, was there, and flying back from New York in six hours. A Jewish family in Babylonia, well, they might be quite well settled there. 
making a tolerable living. And then when Cyrus the emperor said, Jews must return to Jerusalem, think of 35-year-old Benji, a Jewish man married with four young children. He might have said to his mother and father, well, mother, father, I've decided I'm off to Jerusalem. The Lord has provided me now with a new start. I'll be off with my wife and children. We'll be going next week. You can imagine his mother. Benji, don't do it. Don't go. You can't take our babies away with you. We're never going to see you again. And in all probability, they never did. So there would have been pain and upset in many families and discussions running on for decades as to whether Benji had done the right thing. But then, 80 years later, more members of those same families burned their bridges, trusted the Lord, and set off, leaving behind the relative safety of Babylonia and setting out with Ezra on an adventure with an uncertain outcome. Now, Ezra knew that he was asking these family heads to take courage and put their trust in the Lord. Now, think of us. There will be times in our lives as a church when we have to burn our bridges and set out into an uncertain future, trusting the Lord. Didn't we have to do this a number of years ago? We burnt some bridges then, didn't we, and trusted the Lord. No doubt we'll be asked to do other similar things in the future, which may seem costly and very uncertain. But let's allow Ezra's band of pilgrims to encourage us. Or think of us on the individual level. Sometimes we have to launch out, leaving a safe situation and setting off into something new and potentially difficult. Well, let's take the long view and be encouraged by Ezra. He was brave, he rounded up his fellow travelers, and they set off. We'll see in a moment how hard that was. But the Lord protected them and brought them safely to their destination. Thirdly, Ezra understood the people's greatest need. <clears throat> now, just have a look at the paragraph that begins at verse 15, verses 15 to 20. It looks rather bland on the surface, but when you look carefully at that paragraph, you realize that it's full of tension and drama. Verse 15, Ezra speaking, I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava, and there we camped three days. Has anybody here ever been camping? Yes. Think of this campsite. There were many hundreds of people there. Verses 2 to 14 list at least 1,500 men. And if you look down to verse 21, you'll see that children and goods are mentioned as well. Whole families are involved. You can be certain that if the children were there, the mothers were there as well. And the goods, supplies for a four-month desert trek. Have you ever taken your family on holiday for one week? How much baggage do you have to take for one week? as you weigh it on that thing at the airport. Four people, let's say, going, going, going away for a week. A hundred kilos? Huh, you're still counting, aren't you? Can you, especially if you have daughters. <laughs> can you imagine, can you imagine the baggage required by this huge crowd of people? The tents, the pack animals, the water carrying equipment for four months. So there they are, they're camped by the river for three days. Mom, when are we going? Mom? Is it going to take us long to get there? Now, during those three days of being camped by the river, what was Ezra, the expedition leader, doing? Verse 15, he's reviewing the people and the priests. In other words, going through lists, naming names, family records, and so on. And as the three days go past, he becomes increasingly horrified to realize that, verse 15, none of the sons of Levi were there. No Levites. So Ezra says, this expedition is going nowhere until we have a decent number of Levites with us. Just imagine the tension and consternation running through the camp as word gets around that the start is being delayed. I mean, it's bad enough when your flight to Tenerife is delayed by three hours, isn't it? But this, this was drama in the camp. And I don't suppose that Ezra was too popular. So... Why did there have to be Levites? The answer is that from early times, certainly from the time of Moses, about a thousand years earlier, the tribe of Levi 
was given a unique role amongst the 12 tribes of Israel. The tribe of Levi was the priestly tribe, and the men of the tribe of Levi fell into two categories, known as priests and Levites. And the Levites functioned as assistants to the priests. They had all kinds of responsibilities to do with running the temple. They had to organize the sacrifices and uh, look after the temple furnishings and so on. But while Ezra certainly needed them for those ceremonial purposes, his main reason for needing Levites was rather different. Now to see what that was, perhaps you'd turn with me a few pages on to Nehemiah chapter 8. You'll find that on page 403, Nehemiah chapter 8. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are one book in the old Hebrew Bible. So Nehemiah chapter 8. Now Nehemiah reached Jerusalem some 13 years after Ezra. And Nehemiah's great task was to rebuild the walls of the city. But he and Ezra worked together closely. And this eighth chapter records a great day of assembly in the main square of the city, which would have been a bit like George Square in Glasgow. I'll read from verse 1, Nehemiah 8, 1. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattithiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maseah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, friends, we're thinking Levites. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maseh, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites. See that? The Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They, that's the Levites, read from the book from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Now, friends, doesn't that bring tears to your eyes? It certainly threatens to bring them to mine. It's a wonderful picture. There is Ezra. He brings out the book of the law of Moses. That would have been a number of great heavy parchment scrolls. A platform has been built, something much bigger than this, in the square. And a desk or a lectern, no doubt, has been placed on it to support uh, these scrolls. And then Ezra reads out loud from the books of Moses. It says, from early morning. When's that? Cock crow? Six o'clock? Right the way through till midday. If Danish pastries or bacon rolls were served at nine o'clock, there is no mention of them. Well, it wouldn't have been bacon anyway, would it? And verse three the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. But when midday finally comes, you think we have long services here sometimes, don't you? When midday finally comes, the meeting is still not finished because, verse 7, the Levites then go into action teaching the people the meaning of the law so that they can understand what Ezra has been reading. So it wasn't enough for the words of the Bible to be read out loud there also had to be a small army of teachers who could help the people to understand them. Now, isn't that a wonderful picture of the people of God listening to the words of God and being taught the meaning of the words of God? And this is why Ezra held up the departure of the returning exiles. He had to have a small army of Levites with him because he knew how much he would need them to help him to teach the law of Moses to the people in Jerusalem. Now, friends, take the long view. Has anything changed? Well, the superficialities may have done, 
but the heart of the matter is exactly the same today. What people need, what the people need, is to be taught the life-giving words of God. Why is it that so many church congregations in Britain today are small and discouraged and spiritually hungry? It's because they're not being fed the words of God. There aren't enough Levites to get in there and teach the gospel, to, to teach the people. And that's why we need to keep on giving ourselves to the task of training up small armies of Bible teachers, men and women, who can get into the churches and bring the bread of heaven to the hearts that are hungry. Now just look on, still in Nehemiah chapter 8, let's look on to verse 9 to see the results of the work of the Levites. Verse 9, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he, that's Nehemiah, said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, feast, he's saying, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to the Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people and said, Be quiet, calm down, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So do you see how weeping turns to rejoicing as the people begin to understand the words of the Bible? And you and I know just how true that is. Our circumstances in life can often be rather stressed and pressurized, but as we come to understand the meaning of the Bible, we are given a joy which cannot be taken from us. Verse 12 there, great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Well, let's turn back now to Ezra chapter 8. <clears throat> Why were the Levites not there initially? Why did Ezra, in verses 16 and 17, have to send a, a rather weighty delegation of senior men to a man called Ido at a place called Cassiphia with an urgent demand to recruit men to join Ezra on the journey so as to be ministers for the temple? Why were the Levites not showing up initially? Well, we're not told, but it's not hard to guess the reason. Presumably, it was safer and more comfortable just to stay in Babylonia. Who wants to leave his comfortable little house with its orchard and cornfield and vegetable patch to go trekking across 900 miles of scorpion-infested desert? But you'll see from verses 18 to 20 that about 40 men were persuaded to come. And as verse 18 emphasizes, it was due to the good hand of God being upon them. So let's take the long view. The recruiting and the training and energizing of modern-day Levites is a crucial ingredient in the re-establishing of the gospel in Scotland. We've just had our Servants of the Word training conference at Bath Street uh, in, in this very room uh, a few days ago with about 100 people here. Um, it's a training conference aiming to teach and encourage young Bible teachers. A few older people slip in, but it's mainly the younger ones. And during a coffee break two or three days ago, I was talking to one of the conference members, an older man from Aberdeenshire. And he put his hand to his chin, which was covered with a gray beard. And he said to me, I'm a gray beard, but I'm thrilled to see so many black beards here. All these young men, assistant pastors, young senior pastors, Cornhill students, UCCF staff workers, relay workers, and a number of others, including some fine young women. He was thrilled to see these energetic young adults committing themselves to the work of Bible teaching. Dick Lucas, I think on Wednesday, stood up and gave a talk at the conference. There was Dick, age 90, a kind of Ezra-like figure. And he gave us a fascinating historical study or overview of training for Christian ministry from the 16th century to the present day. And his message to us all was, let's get on with the training. Let's fill Scotland with Levites. He didn't put it quite like that, but that's what he meant. Now think for a moment of our Iranian congregation here. 
As you know, something like 150 Iranians are piling into this building every Sunday evening. And, um, and it's great to have them. Why is it? Why do they come? Is it just that they're being welcomed and plied with tea and cake? Is it just because they're receiving help and support with asylum applications and so on? No, it's not. The main reason why they're coming is that their ears are being opened to the life-giving Bible gospel. Man cannot live by bread alone. There they are. They've fled an oppressive Islamist regime. They're dislocated. They're far from home and family, many of them quite upset and depressed. But they are hearing the life-giving words of the Bible, and many are realizing that the Bible brings life in a way that the Quran never can. And as you know, a number of our congregation are acting as Levites to them, putting in long, hard hours. Yes, helping them with asylum applications and English language learning, but above all, helping them to understand who Jesus is and what he has done for them. Our Iranians need Levites, just as the people of ancient Israel needed them. So this process of training and commissioning Bible teachers, that's a process that our church can joyfully put its weight behind. Think of our Paul Brennan. Paul Brennan is being made into a kind of senior Levite tonight at Kelvin Grove. He's going to be ordained. Ordination means recognition and authorization. Recognition of suitable gifting and appropriate training and sound moral qualities. Neither a drunkard, a womanizer, light-fingered with money, or an angry person. Recognition of these things followed by authorization. Authorization by the church to do the work of a pastor, preacher, and teacher. And we need to have a constant stream of embryonic Levites in the pipeline, many of whom, after suitable training, may be sent elsewhere in the way that we've just sent Rupert Hunt Taylor off to Edinburgh. Friends, it is a very great privilege to be involved in this kind of training and sending. And some of you who are sitting here this morning looking so demure and as if butter wouldn't melt in your mouths will one day need to become Levites, either as full-time Bible teachers or doing that work alongside your day job. Ezra said, we're not budging from this riverbank until we have Levites on board so that when we get to Jerusalem, we can fill the streets and the lanes and the passageways and the wines of the city with the word of the Lord. And isn't this what weary old Scotland so much needs today? Don't you feel the weariness and the misery of so many faces that you see as you walk through the city streets? The people of Scotland today are drinking at the fountains of atheism, agnosticism, hedonism, and in some cases, perverted eros. No wonder there's so much sadness and weariness and confusion. What the country needs more than anything else is armies of Levites who will bring the word of the Lord with love and compassion, not just into the churches, but into the streets, the towns, the villages, the businesses, the places of industry and learning. And in Ezra's day, chapter 8, verse 18, it was the good hand of our God that caused the Levites to step forward and prepare for service. The Levites responded, but it was the Lord who impelled them. Fourth, the last two points are much briefer, don't worry. Fourth, Ezra understood the need for congregational prayer. Look at verses 21, 2, and 3. The Levites are now gathered. Everybody's ready to go. But Ezra holds up the departure once again, and this time for a very different reason. He sends an announcement through the camp. We're going to fast. We're going to humble ourselves before our God. In other words, we're going to recognize our frailty and our weakness. And we're going to ask God to give us a safe journey. And it's in verse 21 that Ezra mentions the children and the goods. The campsite was full of children, and children are obviously vulnerable. And as for the goods, well, just look on to verses 26 and 27 where the goods, are, or some of them, are described. A talent of precious metal weighs about 75 pounds, as your footnote, footnote will tell you. 
So this expedition was carrying an awful lot of precious metal, rich pickings for desert bandits. But verse 22 helps us to see why Ezra was so insistent on a time of prayer. 22, for I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. You see, Ezra had been to see the king, Artaxerxes. We first learn of that interview back in chapter 7, verse 6, where Ezra writes, the king granted Ezra all that he asked for, notice this key phrase, the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Now that's the key phrase of the whole book of Ezra. You might almost subtitle the book, the hand of the Lord our God. And here it is again in chapter 8, verse 22. At your majesty, Ezra would have said, your majesty, most excellent Artaxerxes, I would have you know, sir, with all due respect to your royal person, that the hand of the God of Israel is on his people to protect them and fulfill his purpose for them. Now, how could Ezra, having said that to the king, come back to him a little bit later and ask for a troop of Persian soldiers to accompany them and protect them? Oh, Ezra, the king might have said, has the hand of the Lord your God grown a little bit tired since you last spoke to me? Does the Lord your God need a few Persian soldiers to help him out? I thought he was invincible, but perhaps I was mistaken. Now, Ezra couldn't risk that kind of comment. The Lord's reputation was at stake. So he said to the people, we must fast and pray. And they did, as verse 23 tells us. When the people of God get together and pray, they express their frailty and need. They needed to pray on that riverbank in 458 BC, just as we need to pray at our prayer meetings in 2016 AD. I am weak, but thou art mighty. That's the conviction which is at the heart of every prayer meeting. When a congregation prays, it is recognizing the real state of things, human weakness and divine power. Ezra understood this, and he teaches us to follow his example. Fifth and last, Ezra understood the need for good administration. And this is what the last part of the chapter is all about. Verse 24 trustworthy men are selected by Ezra. Verse 25, the precious goods needed for the temple are weighed out and counted and listed. Verses 28 and 9, Ezra solemnly charges the selected men to guard all the goods and make sure they reach Jerusalem in safety. Verse 30, the selected men take charge of the goods and prepare to take them to Jerusalem. Oh, excuse me, Ezra cries out a young man from the back of the congregation. Do we need to know all this stuff? This is backroom boy business, isn't it? We don't need to know the precise weight of all this gold and silver. We can all count to 200 if we really have to, but it's so boring. I mean, we've prayed, haven't we? Isn't that enough? Sit down, young man, says Ezra. We do need to know about these things. What you call boring administration is absolutely vital to the success of our expedition. Now take the long view, admin, admin, that comfortable red chair that you're sitting in. How did it get there? Good admin. The roof over our heads, why is it not leaking? Usually. Good admin. The musicians, how did they know which pieces to play this morning? Good admin. These yellow leaflets that we have, how do they get together with all the information? Good admin, not by magic. In Ezra's case, the admin all worked. Verse 31, the expedition set off. Verse 32, they reached Jerusalem four months later. Verse 33, all the goods were carefully weighed out. Verse 34, everything was properly catalogued. And in the last two verses, 35 and 36, sacrifices are offered and final administrative but very important details are sorted out. So from the pen of Ezra, we're given a vivid picture of how this unique expedition was carried out, unique in many ways. It was a kind of second exodus. But from the long view, there was much about Ezra's work 
that we have in common with him. The need for Levites, the need for prayer, the need for painstaking administration if the church of Jesus Christ is to prosper and be healthy. But if Ezra thought, having reached Jerusalem safely, that his trials were over, he was mistaken. He was soon to discover that when the laws of God are faithfully taught and pressed into the people, they can unearth resistance and sin. And this unearthing can lead to pain and trouble, as we shall see next week in the final episode of the story. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the example of your servant Ezra, for his devotion to your law and to teaching it, and his devotion and love for your people. Help us too as we seek to honor your son Jesus, to love all of the Bible. We pray that you'll raise up more teachers who will press your life-giving words into every part of Scottish society so that your name may be hallowed and the name of our Lord Jesus covered with glory. Amen. I am weak, but you are mighty. That's a line in our last hymn, which is number 868. Guide me, O my great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. Number 868. Why shall we stand and close by saying the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.